right, good morning church, good morning everyone. Let's go ahead and rise and prepare our hearts this morning for what the Lord has for us this morning, amen. You guys are very quiet for those who just joined online, are we still sleepy? Well, let's go ahead and start the prayer this morning, amen. Dearly Father, we just give you thanks, Lord Father God, honor and glory, Lord Father God, for giving us another day to come to your house and praise and worship your holy name, because your name is above all names, Lord Father God. This time, Lord, may we, may we just dedicate this time, this service, all on to you, Lord, and all of our attention. May anything that may come in as a distraction in our minds and our hearts, Lord, may we just lay it all down to your feet. May this not just be another routine or fire another service, Lord Father God, but may we use this opportunity as a time to open up our hearts to you, Lord Father God, and to praise and worship you together as a church, Lord Father God, because there's no other greater feeling than that, Lord Father God. We just give you all the praise, honor, and glory, Lord, because you deserve it all and so much more. And the church of God say, Amen and Amen.
stuff to do here before we get started. Can you hear me back there, Rick? Okay. All right. Um, good morning. Uh, just want to let you know some of the things that has been going on and some of the things that will be going on. Um, Sally and I got a pleasant surprise this week. We got a call from our youngest daughter. Um, her uh, oldest son, Boaz, he's about eight years old, is going to be baptized next Sunday. So... <clears throat> A little lesson everybody can take from Boaz that when he went to talk to the pastor and stuff and go through the classes, he was the only one signed up for baptism. So he got to go through the classes all by himself, but he was not 
bashful about it or anything. That's what he wanted. That's what he was going to do. So uh, also uh, we had the last two days, we had a rummage sale here at the church. And from what I hear, the proceeds, were, everything went well. Uh, proceeds were all donated to Joshua's ministry in India. He's one of the pastors we support. They have a um, orphanage, support an orphanage there. So that's where the proceeds from that went. Um, also, we've trimmed some of friends. February stuff off. The next ladies Bible study, February 15th, that's the AM group at Sister Kathy's house at 11 AM. Uh, then on the 18th, there's an evening group here at the church. Um, you can see Bianca for that one if you need any other details. That, well, that one's supposed to be at 6 PM. Then the marriage discipleship, picnic after dark. That's gonna be next for Sunday on February 14th, Valentine's Day, from 4 to 7 p.m. We're gonna have it inside here. Uh, Sally's got some uh, papers there if you need one of them uh, as far as uh, what you need to bring. It's, we're gonna do picnic. You can bring a table and set it up. You can bring a blanket or a tablecloth and sit on the floor if you like. Uh, you bring you and your spouse's food for your picnic and uh, any decorations you want for your table, your blanket, any lighting per se. Um, and then Sally and I are gonna give a little talk for that too, but we're, we're gonna eat first, first while the food's warm. <laughs> so uh, that's next Sunday. Uh, on February 27th at Shine Bright Church, they have More God, Less Me conference from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Of course, that's the Pastor Sonny's church. Um, and then after the service today, uh, after we turn off the camera and stuff, uh, we're gonna have a baby dedication. So you wanna stay just a little while after that, after the service for uh, Brian and Genesis children today. So, and, in, and for what I understand, we may have one again next Sunday too. So um, I think that's most of the announcements. Uh, as we dismiss the kids for classrooms, junior high, high school, and the elementary school, we'll go ahead and do that now. You can kind of greet each other from a distance and uh, drop your offering in the boxes if you got it. Thank you. His last announcement was, and we'll let Kevin come up. Is it on now? One, two, three. It wasn't on. Oh, well, it's on now. We're all good. God, I love all this technology, don't you? No, you don't. You have to use it, but you don't have to love it. Good morning. Good to see a couple new faces for our baby dedication today. Pretty awesome. Nobody got a chance. Nobody got a chance to shake their hands today because we all know why, right? Something to do with this thing they put on my face. So this morning, we're going to be continuing in the Book of John, and we're in Chapter Twenty. Yeah, that, that was the cue for you to open your Bibles just in case you didn't get that. Um, we're going to be starting from verse 19 and going to verse 31. And in this, this passage, we're going to see, um, uh, we're, at, we're at the place where Jesus lived his life, he died, uh, rose again, and uh, he's going to be talking with his disciples. And um, these are the, the first conversations right after he rose from the dead and some of his last conversations on earth after he rose from the dead. He's already done everything for our cleansing, our salvation, and our eternal life and our acceptance in the presence of the Father. 
eternal acceptance. But we're going to see in, in this passage, there's one more thing that lacks. And it's a carryover from last week, and then we're going to get into that. We're going to see in this passage that it's the actual beginning of the eternal life uh, of the disciples. And, and the place that we understand our eternal life, where it begins and why it begins. Uh, so I want to start off um, just backing up just a, a little bit in, into Danny's sermon last week. We always joke with each other as we go back a little bit. You didn't preach it right, you know, I got to read it. No, I'm just kidding. No, 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 that's not why. I just want to back up into uh, John 20, verse 17. Um, Jesus to me, makes this interesting statement, and it's like not uh, readily evident what it means. He says, uh, he said to her, talking to Mary, the first person that got to see Jesus risen from the dead, he said to her, do not cling to me. Or in other words, don't come up and give me a hug. For I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father to my God and your God. So Jesus had just risen from the dead. And he says, he says the reason that she cannot cling to him is because he had not gone to the presence of his Father. Uh, that was the one thing that was lacking in the whole process of the work of Jesus for our salvation. And the Bible doesn't explain, this is why he said, don't cling to me. It doesn't give all that full explanation, but if you look at what the rest of the Bible says, this is my conclusion. Don't cling to me. I have not yet risen. The reason is I have not yet risen, uh, ascended to my Father. Jesus, the man, had done all of his work on earth for our salvation, for the cleansing of sin. He rose from the dead, proven that he had uh, power over death, but at this moment he had not yet ascended to the Father. And, and, and I look at that, this as the final step of the formal presentation of all that Jesus had done. Because what Jesus did um, was to secure our ability to be in the presence of the Father for eternity. But the Son, after he made the sacrifice, rose from the dead as the perfect man who did all this work for our cleansing, hadn't presented himself to the Father. Because what has to happen uh, for us to be eternally in the presence of the Father is the wrath of God against sin has to be calmed. You're, you're realizing that God is angry towards sin. He's holy, he's perfect, he will not let any sin in his presence ever. And for us to be in his presence, all of our sin has to be washed away. So Jesus ascended to the Father and presented himself as the last formal step in this whole process. The perfect sacrifice went to the presence of the Father, the man, went to the presence of our Heavenly Father and said, Father, it's done. I'm back in your presence. And the Father accepts the Son, the perfect God-man who, uh, who did everything to cleanse us from our sin. And if that's the moment, at least that's the way it looks to me, that's the moment where God's anger towards sin gets washed away for all of us who believe. Sin's done, taken care of. Here, here's my son. He did it all. He's in my presence. Now, he's our forerunner. Now we get to be in the presence of the Father for eternity. Because Jesus did that for us. And the wrath of God for our own sin is calmed down. And Jesus did what we needed to be cleaned. And, and Mary wasn't clean at that moment. She was a sinner still. And Jesus couldn't be touched by sin before he presented himself to the Father. After that, Mary could have hugged him all day long because she was cleaned. Because she believed what Jesus did for her. And so after that, we get into uh, John chapter 20. I'm going to read from um, 19 to 23 for now. So on the evening of that day, okay, it's the very same day, rose from the dead, talked to Mary, hadn't sent it to the Father yet, then ascended to the Father, and then came back. On the evening of that day, same day that he rose from the dead, same day he talked to Mary, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. 
And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I, I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, then they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, there's, there's some curious statements in there, isn't there? Uh, and, and, and just right there, forgetting about the, what the Bible says, it's really hard to understand what they mean. If you look at the rest of the Bible, we're going to look at some of the meanings of those phrases. But they were, the disciples were in the house, locked the doors, and they were afraid. Because the Jesus they had been following for these previous years, the Jews and the Romans just killed him a couple days previously. And so Jesus comes into their presence in the midst of that condition. They're afraid for their life because they've been following the one that the rest of the society, Jews and Romans, hated. And they killed him. Jesus comes into the midst of that. Peace be with you. The first thing he says, Peace be with you. And that's not by accident, because that's exactly what they needed to hear from Jesus. They were afraid. And now, without doubt, the disciples were in a dangerous situation. It was real. The Romans and the Jews did not like Jesus or his followers. Um, so they were in a difficult situation. And that's what difficult situations cause for us, right? Fear. We get to be afraid of, of things. Even actual fear of death. People, I've heard it said that the root of all fear is the fear of death. That's the worst thing that we can happen to us as a human being if you don't understand spiritual truth. That's not the worst thing that can happen to us, though, right, as believers? And, and, and I would say it's probably impossible to live in peace unless you understand the reason why you can be living in peace in the midst of difficult circumstances. Like somebody tells me, live in peace and things are chaotic around me and they don't explain to me why. It's like, I'm not going to understand that, much less grab hold of it for myself. Peace be with you. And Jesus goes on to explain the reason. And it's explained here in John and some of the other Gospels. In the midst of current circumstances, Jesus said, peace be with you. In these days, are you grabbing that for yourself? Peace be with you? Are you grabbing that for yourself? Jesus says to us, peace be with you, because the reason for that peace applies to us as well. Um, as Christians, as believers in the almighty God of creation, we should not be living controlled by fear. Now, we are controlled by fear at times, but we need to come back to Jesus. Him saying, peace be with you. And why? I'm glad you asked that why. I'm going I'm to explain it right now. <coughs> Jesus says, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. The Father sent Jesus knowing exactly what would happen to him, right? Because he knows all things. He knew he was going to go into... The words difficult circumstances don't even get, explain well enough what Jesus had to go through. But the Father knew it. Every single detail of the things that happened to Jesus and his um, suffering, and we already heard a, a message about that. Father knew, and he sent them anyway. Um, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Peace be with you. You can go. Um, the Father gave Jesus a mission. And Jesus gave us a mission. And it's the same sort of kind of mission. To go out and make followers of Jesus. Jesus made followers of himself. Jesus did way more than we're going to do, though. I mean, he paid for our sin. But, but that mission of... Making disciples, Jesus did, fulfilled, and he gave that same mission to us. Jesus is saying to his disciples, you guys don't have anything to be afraid of. You don't have anything to be afraid of. 
peace be with you. You have something to do now. Just like I had something to do when I came to earth. In Matthew chapter 17, I'm sorry, chapter 28, verse 17. This is the same, around the same time period as what we're seeing in John right now. Matthew chapter 28. And people look at this as the Great Commission. I'm just going to say, this is another Christian passage. Just like Jesus rose from the dead, we need to believe him. This is another passage in the Bible that's just a Christian passage. Not just for missionaries that go off in some foreign land. It's for all of us. And around the same time, time period, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Matthew 28, 17. And when they sit, saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, this is it. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Because that's true, I'm saying to you, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of every people group, every ethnic group, every culture, every language. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And at the end of verse 20, he says, Behold... I am with you always to the end of the age. Now, if Jesus, the Son of God, if Jesus, the creator of the universe, is with us always, what reason do we have to live in fear? Of anything, anything. Okay, right now, we're in, a lot of people are living in fear because of this virus. But as believers, we need to grab hold of this. Even in the midst of this, we do not need to do anything motivated by fear. Now, we get there sometimes, but we need to remember. We need to go back and read. What's, what are Jesus' words? What's the level of his power that's with us? The God who has control of every little tiny uh, microscopic virus, every single one has control of where it goes and where it doesn't go all the time and has a plan for it. In the midst of that, or whatever other circumstance we're going through, we do not need to be motivated by fear. Check your hearts. And help other people check their hearts. If they're a believer, we get trapped in fear sometimes, but we always have a way out. Help them not live in fear. Now, all kinds of decisions are made for our lives, and lots of those decisions can be motivated by courage. But they're different decisions, different circumstances. Or they can be motivated by fear. Peace be with you, Jesus said. The Father gave Jesus a mission for our sake. No, the Father gave Jesus a mission for our sake. Jesus gave us a mission for everyone else. Go and make disciples of all nations. I say this because we need to grab hold of that for ourselves. So that I can align what I'm thinking and doing and saying according to this mission. Because I can do a lots of stuff not aligned with this mission. But lots of stuff that I can do that I'm already doing, if I recognize what my mission is, I can align how I do those things with that mission. That can change our attitudes, our actions, and our conversations. I can be talking with my neighbor about whatever... Or I can be talking with my neighbor and look for opportunities to talk about God, to talk about Jesus Christ. And we're also going to find people who don't want to hear it. But even with those people, if we're aligned, our mind is aligned with our mission, we can bring God into the conversation without having to preach at them. People just plainly tell you, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. But we can align our conversations to talk about God in our own lives. And line our conversations to cause people to doubt their atheism. Doubt their lack of care about spiritual things and eternal life. We can align our minds with this mission of making disciples and it can help us in everything we do and every conversation we have. That's the, that's the mission that Jesus Christ has given each individual one of us and us collectively. And this is after he rose from the dead and some of his final words to disciples. How important is that? Then he goes on. Well, just a, just a couple examples. Making disciples. Of course, I already mentioned talking to your neighbor. How about leading music? 
Can you make disciples while you're leading music? Absolutely. Don't I need good words in the song to praise God with? Choice of words uh, and, and what we choose to sing. And I'm thankful because is Danny even here? I was going to praise him, but uh, oh, he is here. He's, he does a, close your ears for a second, would you? He does a really good job. Okay, now you can unplug him. Um, and, and so that can either be, oh, we choose songs because they, oh, they, they sound good, they have a good rhythm. That's not making disciples. But words that truly honor God, that's encouraging me and helping me grow in my process of being a disciple of Jesus. Raising your kids. Are you making disciples of your kids? Teaching them to know and love and obey God? Make disciples. Now, whether it sticks or not, that's between them and the Lord, but our job is to do that disciple-making process. Then in verse, um, back to John chapter 20, 22 and 23. Again, uh, some curious phrases at, the, at, the, at a casual reading. And he said, and, and when he, he, had, he had said this, peace be with you, he had already said that, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. What in the world is going on with this? He breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit. Where else in Scripture do we find God breathing on someone? I only know of one place. Genesis. When God created the body of Adam, lifeless, God breathed in, into him life. And when God breathed into him life, we see all the circumstances after his life, he had the opportunity for eternal life on earth. That's the opportunity he had before him. Can you imagine that? Eternal life on earth. I don't want eternal life on this earth the way it is now, but then it was perfect. He had that opportunity before him. God breathed his own breath into Adam's body and he became a living being. And so Jesus got his disciples around him. Do you realize they're still dead in their sin, right? Um, and he breathed life into them. Eternal life. And I wonder if that was the beginning of their actual eternal life when they received the Holy Spirit. They didn't, I, they didn't understand it. Jesus knew what he was doing because all had been accomplished for this breath of eternal life to be breathed into them. The Holy Spirit. And I'd always thought, oh, Acts chapter 2, that's when the Holy Spirit came into them. But what's going on here? Receive the Holy Spirit, he said. And they had the Spirit, they had eternal life, but they didn't understand it yet. They were going to, but they didn't understand it yet. I mean, a very short amount of time, they were going to get it in Acts chapter 2. Um, because God intended for us to live in, for eternity, at least that was the offer to Adam, forever on earth, but not the way it is now. Sin came in and wrecked everything. So just like God breathed into Adam's body, Jesus breathed into the disciples and therefore into us as believers. Do you know what that means? That means plan A is now back on track. Plan A with Adam. Perfect relationship with God, eternal life, back on track. Because Jesus, you have, you have Adam's life, a very short amount of time. You have all the rest of the history up to Jesus, kind of like a... a Parenthesis, not, not for God it wasn't, but the way we look at it. And then Jesus comes back and to keep the same plan A going because it looks like a plan B somewhere, but not really. God starts doing everything right after Adam to keep his uh, plan on track. And he's going to accomplish it. And everybody who believes gets to participate in that. Then, he, um, <coughs> then another curious verse. Oh, let's see, where'd that go? Get back here. He says, if you forgive the sins of, of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Doesn't that sound kind of crazy? Um, and and I, I, as I was preparing this, uh, this message, 
Is this the same kind of thing that Jesus did to the paralytic? The paralytic comes to him, and the first thing he says before he heals him, your sins are forgiven you. Is that the kind of thing this is? We, go, we can now go around, walk around, forgiving people's sins? Yeah, I'm going to say no, it's not. It's not the same thing. The outcome will be the same. Their sins will be forgiven or not. Um, and so if you take verses out of context, you can get some strange behavior. People walking around and say, oh, your sins are forgiven. No, nobody can do that outside of the person of Jesus. So we have to look at this passage in, in the context of everything else that's happening in the life of Jesus and the disciples. Um, it, you, you're familiar with the word hermeneutics? Bible interpretation. And one of the most uh, important things about Bible interpretation, hermeneutics, um, is context. Context. And that is, how does this fit in everything else that happened in the Bible? Or at least in the life of the disciples. And so it, it, our conclusion about this verse needs to align with what the rest of the Bible says. And it needs to align with what we see the disciples actually doing, like in the book of Acts, for example. And did they do the same thing that Jesus did back then? Walk around healing people or forgiving people? No, they didn't. They did something different. You know what they did? They fulfilled the mission that Jesus gave them to do. And as they preached the gospel, as they explained the message of Jesus Christ, people were forgiven. And as they explained the message of Jesus Christ and people rejected it, they were not forgiven. They were not cleansed. You remember uh, the passage where Jesus says to Peter, I give you the keys to heaven? And so we make up all these things like imaginations of the gates to heaven and Peter standing there with a key, oh, okay, let you in or not let you in, or whatever. Uh, we make up all those kinds of things. That's, that's not reality. It has nothing to do with this. Peter's not letting people into heaven because he has the key. But you look in the book of Acts as, as Peter was fulfilling this mission of making disciples of all nations. You're going to find Peter was the first one to preach to the Jews. Oh, now the Jews have an open presence to the Father. Then he was the first one to preach to the Samaritans. Now the Samaritans, because they were different classes of people to the Jews. And the Jews really need to get this mission of Jesus, all peoples of the earth. He was the first to preach to the Jews. He was the first to preach to the Samaritans, and when they believed and received the Holy Spirit. And he was the first to preach to the Gentiles. He had the keys to heaven. What, so what is the key? What is the key to heaven that Peter had with him uh, to be able to open up that way to the presence of the Father? It was the message of Jesus Christ. That is the key. And Peter started it all off. And Jesus told him he would, which is awesome. Because you know what that means now? You and I have the key. If you're a believer and you understand the gospel and how to explain it, that's the key that opens up the presence to the Father for all those who choose to believe. Isn't that awesome? We have the key. We have the keys to heaven. Not just Peter standing at some imaginary gate. Yeah. Sometimes it's funny and sometimes not so funny. The message is the key. And if you receive the message, you believe, your sins are forgiven. If you reject the message, your sins are not forgiven. You're not cleansed. And sometimes um, people don't hear the message because we don't tell them the message. And sometimes the people we want to tell the message to, we can't because they won't hear it. Their sins are unforgiven. You have people who will not listen to a message about Jesus Christ from you. They will not entertain the conversation. Their sins are not forgiven. Now, we should be trying to look for that opportunity to make disciples, because we can start making disciples before someone believes. We start that process of making disciples. There's all kinds of steps in that process. Evangelism, pre-evangelism, a conversation with an atheist about spiritual things. That's part of that process. Let me get back on track here. I can get distracted with that whole disciple-making process. Um, so the message is the key. People believe it. Their sins are forgiven. And that's, that's the conclusion about that verse that aligns with the rest of Scripture, what we see in the life of the disciples. Hermeneutics. 
the, the process of the science of Bible interpretation. We can't just take something out of context. So, so Jesus had this conversation with them, explained these actually really deep spiritual truths. Uh, I, just, I don't think at this moment they really got it until, until they saw the power of the Holy Spirit. Then they got it. And you see the rest of the book of Acts from chapter 2 on. So again, John uh, chapter 20 goes on in verse 24. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Oh, here we go. Doubting Thomas. We condemn this guy. Don't, doubting Thomas. Don't be a doubting Thomas. Um, but remember in the previous passage, uh, Jesus showed all the rest of the disciples his hands and his side are ready. They got to see it already. And, and the, the, the twelve, the, the, other, the others told Thomas. And, um, but he was not with them at that original, in that original conversation. He says, I will not... Um, Verse 25, so, on the other, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and the place, my fing- place my finger into the, um, into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples um, were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Okay, where did, where did that happen? Just right there in the previous conversation. The doors were still locked. Yeah, it doesn't say they were fearful here, but the doors were locked and they were all together and they probably were. Remind, Jesus brings in reminders into their life. Peace be with you. Peace. You ever need reminders? Let's see, a um, couple of times an hour of every single day of my life, maybe. I need reminders. That, that's why it's no big deal if a pastor teaches something two, two weeks in a row and it's all the exact same thing. I'm going to get new stuff the second time more than likely that I didn't get the first time. So d- don't be afraid to go over things with people because you know how we are. We're forgetful. Then he said to Thomas in verse 27 of chapter 20, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And the Lord answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, You believe because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus is showing an incredible amount of grace and patience in, the, in this, these few verses. And we look at Thomas and we get that doubting Thomas. He's doubting Thomas. Don't be a doubting Thomas. But, but I think any of the other disciples in Thomas's situation, he wasn't there in the first conversation, they would have been the same way. We would have been saying doubting Peter or doubting Matthew or whatever. Because um, the rest of the disciples got to see Jesus' scars, got to see him risen from the dead the first time. And Thomas responds like this, but uh, I can't condemn him because it could have been any of the disciples. So don't be calling me a doubting Thomas, okay? Call me a, if I doubt, call me a doubting Kevin. That's just the end of that story. Um, because the disciples needed to see Jesus risen from the dead, scars still in his hands and feet in his side. And Jesus did all that because he wanted them to believe that everything he said about himself was true. And it was. They got to see it all. Unless I I see, I won't believe, he said. And the disciples got to see Jesus in his earthly life and after he rose from the dead. Because Thomas, I don't think Thomas loved, loved Jesus any less than the other disciples. So Jesus responds with, okay, here I am. Look, touch my hands, touch my feet, touch my side. What a gracious response. What a patient response. Because he knew what the disciples were like. And he'd already given all that to the other disciples so they could believe. And Thomas wasn't there and he also gave it to Thomas. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. Any of those here today? Yeah, all of us. We believe without seeing. Uh, but you know, that doesn't mean 
that we don't have enough evidence to believe. We do have enough evidence to believe, even though we don't get to see. You know what we have? We have eyewitness accounts. And many people in our day and age have investigated this whole literary thing and what could have happened, and what would have happened if it wasn't true, because people would have said something if it wasn't true back then, and we'd have an account of that. That's an interesting study, and it takes a lot of time, and people have done it. And they've concluded, coming from being a, a, a strong atheist, after forensic kinds of investigations of all the details, come out at the end of their investigation, believing Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We have eyewitness accounts. And that's evidence. Previously in Jesus' life, while he was on earth, he, he, he prayed, in John chapter 17, he prayed, I do not ask for these only, the ones that were with him, right there, the disciples, the original disciples, but also for those who believe in me through their word. You know who that is today, everyone, everyone who's here who's a believer? We believe in Jesus through the word of those eyewitnesses. I remember when I first started reading the Bible seriously, I, came, I concluded... I can't find any reason that what Jesus says is not true. This is human life. And that was part of my process of coming to know him and believe him. And I I, I read this passage and I, I, I wonder, is there some special reward for all of us who believe but don't but have and not having seen i don't know if there is or not but jesus said blessed are those who believe without seeing we'll find out when we get to heaven and then these last two verses we're going to look at (coughs) this is the reason right here why we have the bible why we have these these uh, eyewitness accounts In John 20, 30 and 31, it says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You do realize that there's a lot that Jesus did, and we we don't have it recorded for us. Many other signs in the presence of his disciples, uh, probably both before and after his death. Many, many other things said and did. Um, but we have enough. We have everything. That's why we look in the Bible and we ask these questions and there's no answer sometimes. Not everything God has revealed for us. Some things he's chosen not to reveal. But you know what we do have revealed? absolutely everything to know what God is like, to know Him, to believe Him, and everything we need to have eternal life. And not only that, we have everything we need for every single human relationship, every single human experience there's instruction in the Bible about. Father, son, mother, daughter, um, believer, unbeliever, uh, individual and government, finances, um, so many things. I'm not going to list them all. We have everything. There's instruction about it in the Bible. I know of no other book that's that complete. Information of how things began, about the God who created everything, what he likes and what he hates, and how to, how to live on this life and, and love others and, and, and serve and be, be selfless. We have everything. But these are written um, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. That's why we have the Bible. And we could probably say this about every single book and letter in the Bible. This is written so that you may believe. We have enough. We have evidence. Eyewitness accounts. People that lived and experienced things and wrote about it. And those things were how God interacted with the human race. And and from that, we get to see what God is like. Therefore, I want to emphasize the importance of spending time reading the Bible, meditating on it, um, 
and studying it, talking about it with other people, and grow and learn. I've known the Lord for almost 40 years. Now, I, I'm not even that old. I'm only 37. Um, and, and I'm still... I'm still growing and learning. And as I prepare messages like this, I, I, I often tell, say to myself, I never thought about that before. My wife's the same. She's known the Lord for um, way more years than me because she's older than I am. <laughs> not true. Okay, I'll just say not true. And, and she's constantly saying, have I ever read this again? And I know she's read the whole Bible various times. We're constantly learning. God brings different things to mind. And we think about things a different way and we say, wow, that's cool. That's awesome. I didn't understand that about God before. And then we take, grab things from that and we figure out how to apply it in our life and our conversation with other people. To draw, to draw them closer to the Lord. From wherever they are, one step closer. From the atheist. From the person who doesn't even care about spiritual things. One step closer. Maybe not, having, maybe not actually believing, but one step closer. That's the disciple, uh, disciple-making process. Take a person wh- wh- where they're at. Don't try to get them from there 10 steps down the road, but just one step. To get that, take them the next step. One, one little thing at a time. That's making disciples. And Jesus did that very patiently with his disciples. Maybe in some cases, a half step at a time. Because you see some hardness of heart. Stubbornness, right? We don't know anybody who's stubborn. That's a good thing for us, though. So. Okay, we are some of those people, aren't we? We need to know God's Word. We need to get a grasp on the whole of the message of the Bible. And I I like what John says there. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. In a a passage in the letter of 1 John, same author, John says in 1 John 5, 11 to 13, and this is the testimony. It's 1 John 5, 11 to 13. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He gave them eternal life. Because everything was taken care of for God, the wrath of God against sin to be calmed. And then in 5.13 he says, I write these things to you who believe. You who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. My eternal life is done deal. It's written in stone, spoken out of the mouth of Jesus and his eyewitness wrote it down for us. You know, you can know that. No doubt whatsoever. You can know you have eternal life and it started at the moment that you believe for you. And this is why it's written down. We have the eyewitness account. That you may know that you have eternal life in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the explanation we find in your word of how... uh, how we can know that we can have life and have it eternally. Thank you, Lord, that Jesus accomplished everything and he just clearly and patiently, gracefully communicated that to his disciples and we get to join in on that patience and grace and love. Thank you for that, Lord. And we see the disciples fail and we know we fail. But we see what you do, we've done in their lives, and we get to experience what you want to do in our lives now. Lord, give us the grace to continue studying your word, continue to be consumed by it, have our minds changed by it. Uh, Lord, we love you, we thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit, and you've given us eternal life, and we can know it. We can live in it and have confidence in it. Thank you for your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.